thanks for having me. Um, it's one of the things that I've always aspired to do when I sat out there thinking, I'd like to do something one day, you know, and be invited to present there. So I was honored beyond belief when, when I was asked to do this. Um, we're going to start out um, today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got involved with the whole COVID pandemic thing. We're going to talk about monoclonal antibody infusions. We're going to talk about how things have changed over the last eight months or so. Um, we're going to talk about, is it really that bad? Because, you know, you watch, watch the news and, you know, one channel will tell you one thing, another channel will tell you something else. So we're going to talk about, is it really that bad? And then we're going to close by, what can you do to help? And then I'm going to have Dr. Wiley speak to the medical side of what we're doing for COVID. And then we'll join together and answer any questions you have. Okay. So no politics. We are not going to be talking about politics here today. We're going to be talking about science, nursing and medicine and what we can do to help the COVID pandemic. Okay. My interest in COVID began, like the intro said, when I was getting my um, doctorate, preparing for my dissertation project. And with it being an education doctorate, um, my project had to focus on a nursing and education type theme. And so at the time, having been a teacher myself, I know that some professors are better than others at technology and how how they use things, um, how they teach in the online environment. And I know some people have been teaching for 30, 35 years in the classroom setting and really don't have much knowledge. You guys know from being in nursing, you can't be experts of everything. And so I identified there was a gap in, um, in education levels and preparedness of nursing faculty. And I thought, wow, some people were probably really thrown into a tailspin when they got that call that day that everything you do now has to go online. And so I want to, to explore that with some, a group of nursing faculty. I was in bed doing my doctorate. I was in a bad car wreck in 2017 that left me disabled. Well, my nursing heart was just broken in half because I couldn't help with the COVID pandemic. You know how we are. We just want to help wherever we can. And I couldn't. I've had uh, neck surgery, so I'm no longer able to pull on patients. And we know proning someone is not possible if you can't pull on a patient. So I laid there just, just wishing I could help. I even considered going back to bedside nursing and just asking for help when somebody needed to be turned. I didn't do it. You know, I, I came to my senses and, and knew that it wouldn't do anybody any good for me to be in there and not be able to pull my weight. So uh, the company that I work for is IEM. They're called Innovative Emergency Management. They found me on LinkedIn uh, based off of my experience, sent me an email and asked if I would be interested in a CNO position for this project. So that's how I got started. So what are monoclonal antibody infusions? So the antibody is developed in a lab. It's not taken from plasma from another patient. What we do is developed in a lab. It, um, the antibodies go and they bind to the actual virus at the point where the virus would have normally attached to the body cells. If they don't receive these antibodies, then the virus is allowed to live in the body and reproduce uncontrollably. So what, how we describe it to our patients is it's kind of a booster of antibodies until your body has a chance to develop its own antibodies. Um, it has been shown that it reduces the severity of symptoms. It reduces the length of the illness and what we're using it for most now and why the push has been so hard for it now is to prevent hospitalizations. So our hospitals don't get overwhelmed like they did last year. So when you come for an antibody infusion, here's what's going to happen. You'll get checked in at the front. 
you'll be asked to sign a consent for treatment and also a consent for MTRAC entry. MTRAC is the registry, Texas Registry of Immunizations. Uh, the state has asked us to put in this medication as well into that system so that um, you, the public, will have a copy of that in your record. Vital signs are assessed, then you get an IV started. The medication, depending on which one you use and how much saline the medication is in, the, it can go from a half an hour, actually 21 minutes up to an hour, and then observation for an hour afterwards. We monitor every 15 minutes. You're on a continuous three lead EKG throughout, um, vitals every 15 minutes throughout the infusion and for an hour afterwards, watching closely the blood pressure, the heart rate, and the oxygen. So on February 3rd, that's when I entered the scene. So I'm, I don't know a whole lot about what happened last year, but I wanna to talk to you about what has happened in the life of COVID since February 3rd when I started. This is what the CDC had to say about the COVID pandemic on February 3rd of this year. We were in a consistent downward tra trajectory for cases and hospitalizations. Remember, we kind of peaked up, um, I think July, January 8th was the peak. Remember the Thanksgiving and the Christmas made it all go up and then it peaked in January and then started coming back down. This was the sit rep, the situation report on the first day that I worked. We did five infusions. We had zero patients for the next schedule for the next day and we had seen 40 patients total. We started on January 21st. That was the first day of the project. So the rest of January and the first three days of February, we had done 40 infusions. Across the top there, you'll see um, the emblem up top. That's the Texas Division of Emergency Management. These are all the people that are on the project together. Ash Britt is the logistics and infrastructure partner. IEM is my company. City of Lubbock, the County of Lubbock, Covenant Health and UMC Health. We were all partnered together to do these infusions and um, to help, help make Lubbock healthier. So at that point, these were the criteria and I'm not gonna go over them one by one because it's too much. But what I wanna bring your attention to is that a patient had to have at least one of the first is that six? They have to be over 65, BMI greater than 35, a chronic kidney, diabetes, chronic respiratory, or immunosuppressive. Then if you were under 65, but over 55, and you had one of these other, a CV, uh, cardiovascular disease, or hypertension, or chronic respiratory, then you could qualify. If you were 54, You didn't meet criteria. Um, all the way down to age 17, there was no way that we could, according to the EUA, there was no way we could fit people in based on the EUA criteria. 12 to 17 years of age and have that BMI or one of these that are down below it, then they would qualify. If you were 18, so that created a lot, of, um, a lot of turmoil within me, just because I didn't feel like that was such a hard red line. But yet, when you, when you fight bureaucracy and, um, and too, when you only have a limited amount of medicine, there's just the ethical dilemma of how much of that is left to your prerogative and how much needs to be a hard red line. So that's a lot of what, what I was dealing with. And I actually lobbied Eli Lilly, um, who was making the Bamlanivimab and Edisevimab, one of the combo drugs we were using, and also the FDA. Um, I called and left messages urging them both to reconsider the eligibility. Um, so I was doing all I could. 
But it didn't matter because on April 30th, our project ended. So this was the last sit rep that I did on April 30th um, because we were closing our facility. We had done 188 infusions. It's a lot of, a lot of lives saved. You know, we felt good about it. That was on a Friday. We had operated 100 days. On a Friday night, we closed the doors. And then on Sunday night, I get a phone call that says, hey, guess what? <laughs> We're opening back up again. So how that came about, yeah, just kidding. After th that 15 hour day on Friday, trying to make sure all of our stuff was given away and donated to people in the community that, that could benefit for it. Yeah, Friday, just kidding, let's, let's get more stuff. So, um, so we reopened. Make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. We reopened, um, and then on May 6th, we started seeing patients again. What happened in the interim was that um, we had become the only facility in Lubbock that was doing monoclonal antibody infusions. Covenant had passed the baton to us. UMC had passed the baton to us. The tents went away, the infusion center stuff went away, and we were it. Well. Um, when they found out that we were closing, you guys know we're in the middle of nowhere here. If we didn't have infusions here, there were gonna be people, you know, three, four hour drive that weren't, didn't have access to this. And so um, the hospitals lobbied the state and they reopened us. Even if we were, on, I mean, we were literally doing like three and four infusions a week and they reopened us. We were like, you know, expect the unexpected at this point. So we reopened, saw our first patient again on May 6th. And then on the 14th, we get a message that the eligibility criteria had been expanded. Um, it no longer had to, to do with age at all, except we can't treat patients under 12. But they don't have to be 55 and anything. And they also lowered the BMI criteria to 25 instead of 35. And we jokingly say that probably 70 to 80% of Lubbock's walking around with a BMI greater than 25, because it's literally just barely overweight qualifies you now. And they also in included this caveat, other factors may also place patients at high risk for progression to severe COVID. And the EUA is not limited to these medical conditions or factors listed above. So that told us that Dr. Wiley could see somebody in the clinic and decide that this patient would really benefit from the antibody infusion, but there was no box to check off, okay? He could check the other box right in why he wanted this patient to receive antibodies and we could do it. So that really opened us up to be able to do more patients. So we talked about in May, the eligibility criteria expanded. In June, they gave approval to start doing subcutaneous injections for people that you could not uh, do an IV on. Um, you know, if somebody's had a double mastectomy and they don't need an IV, you know, or blood pressure cuff on one arm or something like that, we can do those sub-Q now. For your dialysis patient, you know, their, their veins are awful. Um, we have the same, same we can do for them now. And then in July, not too long ago, um, they approved Regeneron for prophylactic exposure, meaning, and we'll talk a little bit more in specifics about that um, and the difference between the two. So if you are not fully vaccinated and you are in, in exposed to someone with COVID, then you qualify, okay? or if you're immunocompromised and exposed to someone with COVID, you qualify. This also includes people who are at high risk of exposure like in nursing home settings, um, state school, orphanage, you know, that kind of thing. Any type of long-term living arrangement. The um, patients no longer have to be COVID positive and they don't have to be symptomatic anymore. So, is it really that bad? 
So I want to give you a um, comparison of some of the numbers of infusions we've done over the time we've been open. From January to April, I shared with you we did 188 infusions. We opened back up on May 6th, and we did 38 in the month of May. <coughs> in June, we did 37. Now July is when Delta started rearing its ugly head, right? In the month of July, we did 190. That's what we thought. Then the August came. In September through yesterday, we have already done 1,166. Folks, this isn't politics. This isn't religion. This is fact. So these are some, um, you know, people ask me, where do I get my data? What do I look at? Um, let's see, let me come out of here a minute. I want to show you some of the websites that I use. So this is your City of Lubbock dashboard. Let's see if they've updated it. It was 258 yesterday. Let's see if we, oh, not been updated yet. Maybe by the end of our time together today. So I'll look at that just to see how many we had in the city of Lubbock. This is one I like to look at. This, this is called COVID Act Now. This gives you the rate of um, vaccine. On down further on the same page, you see the risk level for the country. You see down here at the bottom, this is your grid. Yellow is low risk. And then this dark maroon is severe risk. You can also further take this down to counties. And then I've broken it down where you can see Lubbock by itself. This is 79, almost 80 cases per 100,000. Infection rate, that just means for one person that gets COVID, they're infecting one other person. Positive test rate for all the ones that we're testing, 16% are coming back positive. And as of right now, 47% of Lubbock County is vaccinated. So this is a neat little website and it's just, it's neat to, to look around it. You can also tell over here, that is Lubbock County. Just above us, Hale is Maroon. Just below us, Lynn is maroon. Hockley and Cochran to the west is maroon. So everybody's having a hard time of it right now. And then this website is called Worldometer. If you wanna see the world or the US compared to the world, you can, um, new cases, the US 164,000, this was yesterday and the next highest was the UK with only 30,000. You can click here and it'll break it down by state. New cases, we won, yay! Ohio right behind us. And then sometimes it'll give you county by county. There you go. And of course, some of the other ones are, are much higher than us just because they have a lot more population. But I just wanted to share that with you and let you guys know of some other places that you can go for, for hard facts. This was our sit rep yesterday. We did 91 infusions yesterday. Remember when we did three a week? We did 91 yesterday. We've already, they already had 60 scheduled for today. That was at end of day yesterday and we've treated 2,694. So how can people get these infusions? There are a couple different ways. Um, a doctor can refer you to us, um, a provider referral, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, we receive our referrals from all of those, or people can do self-referral. I'm a big proponent of the underserved, underprivileged population. Um, the health department, CVS, Walgreens, they all do um, 
testing. Um, and I know Walgreens and the health department is free of charge. CVS, I think, is free of charge for some people. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. But anyway, we can, we can see the underprivileged. They can call us and do a self-referral. They just have to show us a document that says they were positive. And the reason we do that is um, these antibodies, if, if you're close, if you're over your 10 days of being ill, there's a risk that you can get sicker because of this. And so it's important to know when their symptoms started, that it's less than 10 days from symptom onset. And so that's why we track, for people with COVID, it's real important to track when their symptoms first started. It gets a little, a little bit of a gray area when you start talking about exposure, um, them not having to have symptoms, because you say, well, you don't have symptoms now, but did you have COVID already and now you're better? You know, so much of this is still unknown. We're just doing the best that we can with what we have, and that may be something you can speak to in a little bit. But um, we're just rereading. The EUA is our bedtime reading every night just because they update it relatively frequently as far as which medication is the best and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so for a self-referral, we have to have that positive test. They have to have symptoms and their symptoms have to have been less than 10 days. They also have to come to us with oxygen saturation over 90 on room air. Um, one of the side effects of this antibody infusion, it, it can cause worsening of symptoms. So if we had somebody that started off at an 87 and we dropped them three or four percentage points, they're going to the ER. So we're, we're pretty sticklers about making sure that, that it's a solid 90 before we'll infuse. Uh, we also have vital sign parameters. We have seen this medication raise blood pressures. We've seen it lower blood pressures. It has a lot more to do, I think, with the condition of the patient when they come in. You know, are they, do they have a low blood pressure because they're borderline sepsis? You know, is their, is their normal blood pressure usually 180 over 90 and now it's 95 over 60? If we give them that medication, it could tank them and end up in the hospital. So um, the nurses have very strict parameters that they don't start the medication um, unless the vital signs are within that. Uh, we keep them on the ECG monitoring because um, we haven't had anybody go into any cardiac arrhythmias during infusion, but one of my nurses diagnosed a second degree heart block on a patient that came in with the heart rate in the upper 30s and just thought he was short of breath because he had COVID. So it's, people are a lot, <coughs> a lot sicker with this variant than they were with the last one. We, we average sending somebody to the ER at least every other day, sometimes three a day, because you know, if, you're, if your oxygen level was to drop from a 95 to an 85 in 10 minutes, you'd know something was wrong. But if it only dropped one percentage point every day or every other day, you could get down to 88 and, and not really see a big difference, especially if you were sick already and had been laying around. So um, we have a lot of people show up that are a lot sicker than, than they realize. All right, so what are some things that you can do to help this pandemic? You can get vaccinated. There is research out there that shows, no, it's not gonna prevent you from getting COVID. It prevents a lot of people from getting COVID, but we do still see, I would say probably 25, 30% of people that come in with COVID to get an infusion have had the vaccine. But we also are hearing reports that those are the ones that stay out of the ICUs and the ones that are not dying, that the majority of the ones that are in ICUs were unvaccinated. Um, you can wear a mask. Yes, I understand that CDC said 
you know, once upon a time, a couple months ago, that if you've been completely vaccinated, that you didn't have to wear a mask anymore indoors. And I don't remember specifically. I'm not saying they're wrong. Like, you know, once again, I'm not here about politics. I know if we all wore a mask, it wouldn't spread as fast. That's all I'm saying. Uh, practice social distancing. And then if you're infected or exposed to someone that has it, follow the CDC guidelines as far as isolation and quarantine goes. And tell people about these antibody infusions. One of the things that frustrates me is we'll get calls from people that have been sick for eight or nine days. And we're seeing that around day seven is when they're either starting to get better or they're starting to get worse fast. And if they would have just come in right after diagnosis with a runny nose, we could have kept them from getting that sick on day eight. But so many people go, well, I, I've had COVID for a little over a week now and I thought I was gonna do all right, but just yesterday, I really started feeling bad. <laughs> just wanna pull my hair out. And I've done everything I can, everything I know to, to get the word out. And Covenant and UMC, they've been wonderful about helping get people to us now. It's really a concerted effort with everybody in the whole city to, um, to treat this. But I mean, even if, even if you think you might not qualify, if you, if you know somebody that's got it, make a phone call, call me and let's see if they qualify. Um, with these laxed eligibility stuff and the new exposure rules, they probably will qualify. And so um, this is one of the biggest, the biggest proponents and what people are pushing to help get the pandemic under control again is the monoclonal antibodies. Just about every time I watch the news now, they're talking about it. And so it's, it's, it's cool on my end because I've, just, I've lobbied and I've lobbied and I've lobbied to let everybody know about it. It's not cool that we still need to be open, but um, we don't talk about numbers and how many we're doing. We talk about how many lives we've saved. And that's how we end every day in our briefing is how many lives do we save today? So we're gonna be there until y'all don't need us anymore. So I'm gonna have Dr. Wiley speak to you a little bit. Um, I did ask him to get a little bit controversial just because I wanna know um, about ivermectin. And um, he's gonna chat with you a, a little bit about the clinic aspect of what we're doing to treat COVID. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Wiley, nice to meet y'all. I've been working with uh, COVID unfortunately for about, uh, well, almost two years now. Uh, when it started, I kind of um, got drafted into working the drive through and then the COVID clinic. So I've seen a lot of it. Uh, I've seen it when it started and when we didn't really know what we were doing and then kind of how it's kind of evolved now to where it's a little bit better education and better guesses, I guess I would say. Um, when we have a patient that comes in that tests positive for COVID, you know, we do a couple of things. Uh, first, you want to kind of, you know, look at the vital signs, make sure they're okay. Oxygen saturation really is the best predictor of how they're doing. Uh, if it gets in the below 90, that's when you really start to worry. But anything below 94 is pretty concerning. Um, when someone tests positive, I talk to them about things they can do, you know, and things that we want to, to, to do and, and things to watch out for, you know, to, to treat them as best we can. First thing you want to do is um, talk to them about getting a pulse oximeter. You know, uh, that's something cheap and easy that they can pick up at the drugstore. Uh, like 20 bucks, you know, you show them what it looks like and you say, this is what it is and this is how it works and show them on their, on their fingers so they know what to measure and what the heart rate is and what the pulse ox is. You want to make sure they're staying, you know, above 94, um, mostly because if they get, uh, you know, in the lower 90s, you can have different treatment options than you would if they stay in the high 90s. So that's the first suggestion you have. And then you start talking to them about, um, you know, uh, quarantine and staying isolated. The rules change quite often, um, you know, for who needs to quarantine and what they need to do. But generally you would say that they need to quarantine for 10 days. 
Um, usually we say that from the time they test positive we quarantine them, but sometimes you can go back. Uh, the CDC website's a little unclear, but generally if they start showing symptoms, you start at that time, uh, the quarantine. But it, it can be very difficult to parse out exactly when symptoms begin. So usually what I say is 10 days from when you test positive. Uh, the family, you know, if they are not vaccinated, we'll have to quarantine for 10 days also. Um, the school sometimes will give conflicting information, but the recommendation is still that the, they, everybody needs to quarantine for 10 days. After that, we talk about, you know, what else we can do. There are some uh, over-the-counter things that we try to see if they will give some benefit. Uh, the only thing that really has a lot of decent evidence would be a uh, high-dose vitamin D. Uh, we usually recommend 20,000 international units of vitamin D a day um, for the 10 days. Um, that is because we know that patients that have uh, vitamin D deficiency do a lot worse with COVID. Uh, the idea is if you can give a large amount of vitamin D, it tends to improve the patient's uh, outcome. Um, that's probably the only one that really has uh, a decent amount of science behind it. And when I say that, I would still say that it's a fairly educated guess, but it's the one that I feel most confident in. Also, you know, we recommend things like uh, vitamin C. Some evidence of vitamin C helps with other viral infections. It may help with COVID, we're not really sure. Uh, same with zinc, 50 milligrams of zinc a day. Might help, you know, that's uh, about how I tell them. You know, it's some educated guesses, not FDA approved treatment, but just our, our best guesses right now. And they're using a lot of uh, vitamin therapy like that in the hospital as well, you know, for patients. Uh, then, you know, you, um, start talking about uh, prescription medications for COVID. That is an area that is evolving that, you know, nobody really has a strong handle on. Uh, I remember when it first started, you know, gosh, we'd see these patients that were really sick, that looked awful. And um, I mean, our treatment was essentially, you know, if you get worse, go to the hospital. Um, that was awful. That's all we had to offer patients, which was really nothing to offer at all. They would go to the hospital and they put them on oxygen or maybe, you know, intubate them if they had to. But we didn't have anything really to offer. And then um, a couple of months into it, you know, we, uh, we got a note from infectious disease that said, you know, we have something to offer. And, you know, and that was uh, Plaquenil and, and uh, azithromycin. Um, and we wrote a few prescriptions for that, but pretty quickly, you know, there was a big study of New York that showed that actually seems to worsen outcomes in patients. So since that, uh, not many patients or not many doctors have been prescribing that medication just because, you know, it doesn't seem to really help and it actually seemed to hurt patients in New York. So you're kind of careful with that. Uh, then we had a few other wonder drugs, you know, budesonide, uh, you know, inhaled corticosteroid. It uh, does actually seem to help patients, and I prescribe that occasionally. Uh, that reduces the time that you're sick, and it seems to um, help patients feel better and improve uh, and decreases the chance they end up coming back uh, feeling worse. Um, but there's not, I would still say the evidence on that is mild and, and moderate, not, you know, really good evidence. Um, but it doesn't seem to hurt anybody, so we prescribe that every now and then. Um, ivermectin is the one that it's kind of made big um, news lately. Ivermectin, uh, you know, it started off because we don't really understand why Africa has not had a really terrible uh, COVID pandemic. Africa has had one of the lowest death rates and, and things have been not terrible over there, which is pretty surprising when you consider the state of the healthcare there. And one of the uh, ideas was that, you know, ivermectin is used prophylactically in that country a lot for parasites and to get rid of, you know, different things. And um, there was a connection, it seemed to, you know, between patients, or countries that used ivermectin and the death rate uh, for COVID. Uh, and we still don't really understand exactly why that is, but boy, that was really hopeful. And they did a really good study that I thought was a really smart idea, you know, to kind of look for reasons why they were doing better with it. And ivermectin is one of the things that seemed to kind of stand out. Um, so we got real hopeful, you know, that ivermectin might be effective. And then they did some um, in vitro studies, you know, using uh, different um, uh, types of studies to, to see if it would work in the lab. And in the lab, it did seem to, you know, decrease the virus's ability to replicate. Um, but the doses that they were using and the amount that they were using was very high, about 100 to 200 times what you would give a patient. So that was really hopeful, you know, that, that was good. So then, um, you know, uh, we talked to infectious disease and, and our protocol actually began, you know, when we were having so many COVID positive patients, the hospital was filling up. And that is a kind of a, a scary time when you are, well, let's say almost desperate to prevent patients from being sick and ending up in the hospital. 
So we would prescribe ivermectin occasionally with doxycycline because uh, the best study uh, showed that that seemed to help patients get better faster. Um, and we gave ivermectin up until I think about a month or so ago when uh, CDC changed their recommendation from, you know, um, uh, not for or against to, you know, uh, don't use unless it's a clinical study. Um, I would say that if ivermectin does have a benefit, that it is probably a pretty small benefit. And it doesn't seem to really help a lot. It certainly doesn't seem to work for prevention. A lot of patients are taking it for prevention. Um, and when we have a treatment that actually works, you know, the monoclonal antibody infusion, there's no reason to, to, to give that medication if we can give them the infusion. Uh, so I always highly push the infusion and recommend that for all the patients because that really is the only thing that seems to really work. A good study, uh, about 4,000 patients um, studied with um, a Regeneron, uh, showed about a 70% reduction in hospitalization. That's, that's huge, you know? That's way more effective than anything else that we talked about, way more effective than vitamin D, uh, Plaquenil, Ivermectin, doxycycline, any of that stuff. None of that stuff works as well as, as the infusion. Uh, of course, the vaccine is more effective. Vaccine's about 95% effective keeping out of the hospital, so that's the best thing, but at the point when they see me, it's too late to, to deal with that, so we send them for the infusion. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time talking to them about the infusion. I, I did have uh, a lot of patients that initially refused it, and I think that's because of the way I presented it, because I kind of um, I used a lot of medical terminology, and I think I made it kind of scary for them. So I, I've kind of really refined my speech down at this point to putting it into uh, terms that I think help them to kind of understand what's going on. So, you know, I draw a COVID molecule, and I say, this is what COVID looks like. It looks like a beach ball with spikes on it. Right now, you've got millions of these things in your body, and they're all floating around. It's using those spikes to jab its you know, jab itself into you and inject its filthy DNA into you and it's making you make more viruses, so many that the cell explodes and just kind of replicates everywhere and that's why you feel so awful, you know. You're building these antibodies to stick on the end of the spikes, kind of like to keep it from getting into your cell, but you're way behind the game right now. You've got a thousand of those and you've got millions of uh, COVID viral uh, particles floating around. What you need is an infusion of those antibodies. We can get you an infusion of antibodies. It's a bag of fluid they give to you. It takes a, an hour or so. And that is the best treatment we have that reduces the chance you end up in the hospital by about 70%. There's no reason not to do that. It's completely free. The state of Texas is paying for it. You already paid for it with your taxes. It will definitely decrease the chance you end up in the hospital. That's the best treatment we have. And I have to tell you how grateful I am that, you know, that the state of Texas is able to set that up for us and to be able to offer something that actually works is so much better for everyone, you know? And just being able to offer that, it just makes me very grateful, of course, to Pam, you know, for all the work that she's doing. Um, because before that, we really didn't have anything to offer and it was scary and awful, you know? And now I just feel a lot better about what we can do. Okay. Any questions about the medical treatment side of COVID for me right now? No? Okay. So, um, for anybody that's been referred for an infusion and they want to make sure we got their referral, they can um, call that top number. And then, if you want to see if you qualify for an infusion, that is our scheduler number. And for any providers you know that have they aren't already referring to us, if they have questions, you give them that number. That is my personal cell number. I don't want to miss a call. I don't care if your neighbor calls me. If they are eligible for this infusion, I want to do all I can to get it to them, okay? We'll get through this together. No questions? What are your hours for the clinic? Um, we work seven days a week. Um, 7.30 to 7.30 is when the nurses are there. We do five different sessions of infusions, um, one at 8, 10, 1, 3, and 5. And they're there about an hour, 45 minutes each infusion. We work holidays and everything, you know, if it ends in an AY, we're there. 
I got a question. Yeah. So do you guys have any like uh, updates for your booster? Is it effective? You mean the booster shot for the vaccine? Yes, sir. We don't know. I mean, Israel is probably the best source of information for that. They're the ones that started doing the boosters early. Uh, the preliminary data looks really good. Um, I can tell you the Delta variant starting to get through the vaccine. It's kind of what you said about 20, 30 percent of the patients I've seen. Uh, they're vaccinated. Uh, the positives are vaccinated. Uh, usually when I see a vaccinated patient, um, I can predict that the, someone in the family is positive. Usually they're living with someone who's positive. They have a heavier exposure. Um, but the booster looks like it may help. But, you know, six months from now, we'll know. I'm going to get mine as soon as I can. <laughs> And you said that you were, um, that you've done everything you could to uh, share this information with the community. What kind of things have y'all done to like advertise or spread the information? Like what all, what all does that look like? Um, I have a, a running contact list. It's about 50 pages Word document now of all the providers I can think of in a, in driving distance within about two hours from here. Um, we reached out to doctor's offices, all the urgent cares, the hospitals. Um, I worked my way up to have some contacts with Dr. Craig Barker. He's over all the UMC clinics. Um, Wes Wells is the director of pharmacy at Covenant. He, um, he helps me get word out. Um, Heather Smith used to be the director of, of the COVID project for Covenant, the um, Covenant Medical Group. Um, she was actually a personal friend of mine, so had that contact. Um, and word of mouth has been more helpful than anything else. We've done flyers. We've taken flyers to different parts of the county. Um, we've reached out to the Hispanic, the Clinica Hispania. Um, we've done the, the y, YWCA, trying to get, they're trying to reach all, all races, all ethnicities. We have a pretty diverse group of staff there, and so they have their connections in their own communities. We've done that. Um, we printed flyers, English on the front, Spanish on the back, <laughs> pass those out as much as we can. Um, we, we had one employee, he went to a, it's been three or four months ago when the police department threw the cookout for the community and, and they were grilling and everything, and that's when we were, we were trying to get the word out when Delta first started to get bad again. And he's always asking me, where, where can I go now to pass out flyers? And so I texted him and I said, if there's this gathering at this community, this park, and there's going to be a lot of people there. And he said, yes, ma'am, I'm on it. And so he texted me like 10 minutes after he was supposed to be there. And he texted me, he said, ma'am, I went by that park. And there were police everywhere. I don't know what was happening. <laughs> but I didn't even slow down. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I guess I should have given you a little more information as to what I was sending you into. But um, everybody has, you know, they have come see me in the afternoon and grab a stack of flyers and, and pass them out on their way home. Um, when we were seeing three patients a week, I would give my nurses a list of people to call. They, they didn't sit around. They get just as much credit as I do for our outreach. And, you know, I, I'm very proud of them because when it did get bad, people knew where we were and they knew who to call. That's great. And have y'all, like, um, touched into, like, the uh, school nurse association for maybe some of those high schools? or um, Not school nurses community. association, but we I've reached out to every school. Yeah within two, three hours drive, especially all of Lubbock County. Um, That's really great. Probably 10 to 15 of those pages are strictly schools and, and school nurses and that kind of thing. Now that they're doing um, regular testing of teachers on Mondays, the, the word's getting out that they can self-refer. So. Um, let, let me just say Monday is a Monday in my world, <laughs> but we're glad to get people treated. What else? Will there not be any limit to the number of doses that were provided? Just recently, like within the last two or three days, um, they have gone back to 
allocating medication to each state based on use and demand. And so we no longer can order how much we think we need. They're going to start giving it to us based on based on our need that is calculated by the number of patients we are treating. So it's I don't like it, but we don't have a choice. I think they're just trying to keep everything even and not get ahead of manufacturing speeds. They did recently re-approve re Bamlanivimab and Edisevimab as a combination drug against the Delta variant. So um, we may be going to use it that as well. We will be using Regeneron as long as we can get it. Um, for, for no other reason than Regeneron is the only one that can be given sub-Q. And you mentioned some effect to vital signs, like oxygenation. Yes, ma'am. Are there any other adverse reactions you've observed? Blood pressure. Um, it, we've seen it go up in some and down in others. And, you know, like I, I alluded to, I think it's more the condition, the underlying condition of the patient as opposed to just the, the medicine itself. But that's just an educated guess. So, Dr. Wiley, if you are asymptomatic but test positive, do you recommend just giving antibodies immediately or do you wait? No, I send everybody to qualify as soon as they test positive. Because I, I've I've had patients before. I remember this one lady, she's an 80 year old female, came in. She'd been vaccinated. She looked great. She tested positive. Her husband tested positive. But they looked completely fine. And, you know, we talked about medication and infusion. She didn't want to do it. And I said, you know, I understand you. You look good. You, you, I don't think you need to. And then 10 days later, she came back. She had a big, horrible double pneumonia. And she ended up in the hospital. And, you know, if, if I had sent her, maybe I could have prevented that. I sent everyone who, as soon as they test positive, it's better to get it done immediately. Right now, we're not at the point where we have to ration care, but I wouldn't ration care for patients like that. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you all so very much. You're welcome. It's wonderful. Thank you very much.